Years ago, an organization that specializes in cybersecurity suffered a data breach. An employee who was dissatisfied with the company and its work exfiltrated and publicized confidential information about its internal workings, which led to international attention and much embarrassment. In the ensuing years, the organization suffered additional breaches, one of which was much more impactful because it involved the loss of some of its most prized assets, the software and source code of the tools that the organization used in its work. Now, this was an organization that had essentially unlimited budget. Even their middle name was security, because this happened to the National Security Agency, to disgruntled employee Edward Snowden, and one of those stolen tools was used in the WannaCry attack, which shut down hospitals and production lines and caused billions in damages. Now, one might ask if the NSA, with all the money it spends on cybersecurity and its access to the best technology and expertise in the world can't protect itself, then what hope is there for the rest of us? To date, the commercial world has fared no better. The situation is bad and getting worse as cyber incidents continue to increase in both frequency and impact. But cybersecurity, or more precisely, the management of cyber risk, presents a paradox. The massive influx of investment and increased attention haven't produced meaningful results. What has improved, unfortunately, is our tolerance and acceptance of larger and larger breaches as inevitable. At the root of this paradox, there is a single reason that we have failed to get returns on our cyber investments. Technology is the central focus of cybersecurity. Admittedly, there are both historical and logical reasons why technology has and continues to be at the center. Computer scientists, of course, were the first to look at cybersecurity. They focused on the specific details of attack and defense and how to build the core or kernel of the operating systems running computers so that they could withstand attack. While people from a number of different disciplines are joining the cybersecurity effort and are assisting in managing cyber risks, technologists have retained their position of prominence. One only needs to look at the large and rapidly growing market for cybersecurity products, services, standards, and professional advice, which is geared to address cyber attacks on computers and the largely technical controls to repel them. Now, of course, without digital technology, cyber risk wouldn't exist, and cybersecurity technologies and the activities surrounding them are important. The focus on technology is in fact seductively dangerous because there is value there. Unfortunately, it is this very focus on cybersecurity technology that ends up undercutting its capacity to protect and is one of the fundamental reasons why we are as poorly prepared for cyber attacks as we are. This phenomenon manifests itself in several ways. It doesn't support the prioritization of cybersecurity investments on the basis of the most significant cyber threats a company faces. This requires a clear connection between exploited commuter vulnerabilities and specific damage to a company's business activities. It deflects attention from non-technical dynamics that significantly affect both the suitability and effectiveness of these technical controls. These dynamics include the motivations, incentives, and interests, aligned or not, of the individuals, departments, businesses, and governments who play a role in a company's cyber protection. Finally, it prevents boards and executives and managers from meaningful engagement this requires expanding the language of cybersecurity discussions beyond technical jargon. The net effect is that a company could spend all of its cybersecurity budget on fixing computer vulnerabilities and never address the real issue of protecting the company. The situation is akin to a university student who just before finals thinks it's necessary to clean her dorm room before studying. In this case, the penalty is just summer school. The penalty for a company that's just been breached is more severe. In the face of all this bad news, a fatalistic drumbeat in cybersecurity has emerged, characterized by the common refrain, it's not a question of if you will be hacked, only when, or there are two types of companies, those that have been hacked and those who don't know it yet. Unfortunately, the spirit of resignation has shifted emphasis to reactive measures to deal with attacks once they occur, rather than prevention or detection. The approach is equivalent of neglecting seatbelts and airbags in a favor of deploying fleets of ambulances and helicopters to ferry car crash victims to emergency rooms. Clearly, we need to change. Now, I have some good news to share. The blueprint for effectively combating cyber risk is right in front of us, 
yet not where we have traditionally looked. At the core of our thesis is that the perspective you have or the way you look at a problem significantly influences the ease or difficulty with which you can understand and address the problem. For example, the Almagest, Ptolemy's treatise on a geocentric model of the universe, was published around 150 AD and followed the conventional wisdom of the day, espoused by both Greek and Arab astronomers. It was confirmed by observation, at least in the beginning when the tools of astro astronomy were not precise, over time, more and more discrepancies appear between the way a geocentric universe would behave and how our solar system actually operates. Copernicus challenged the status quo and introduced the heliocentric model with the Earth and its fellow planets revolving around our sun because he was disturbed at the complexities that had to be introduced in the Ptolemaic system to explain the observed planetary motions. As a scientific model, it simply didn't work. In a similar manner, the current approach to cybersecurity simply doesn't work. Yet, in spite of no discernible reduction in cyber risks, conventional wisdom appears to be double down and commit significantly more resources to a warlike approach that isn't working or being won. Following in the spirit of Copernicus, we propose a revolution in cybersecurity, a change at the center. This change shifts the center of the cybersecurity universe from technology and war, the province of a few, to the actions and making them trustworthy, something meaningful to all. In a business context, this means that if we shift our focus and put our businesses at the center of our cybersecurity efforts by maintaining focus on well-understood company risks, understanding motivations and promoting a culture of open and transparent communication, and applying existing systems of corporate governance, executive direction, and board oversight, in short, if we apply familiar corporate tools that are not cybersecurity specific, we can radically improve a company's cybersecurity activities and posture. What's more, leaders can accomplish this through their existing oversight responsibilities without the need to become cyber experts. Just like Copernicus's heliocentric model, this approach is effective because it considers the larger individual, business, and commercial dynamics that ultimately determine the success or failure of all your company's cybersecurity efforts. Now I would like to discuss how to prioritize company cyber risks, even though there's no such thing as a cyber risk per se. Back in 2013, we were meeting with management at a luxury casino resort located on the famous Kotai Strip in Macau. They had invested heavily in security, including cybersecurity. And as part of our inquiry, we just asked them who owned the telecommunications network that their traffic was on. The room fell silent. The person who was responsible for its network infrastructure looked at us, eyes widening, face visibly blushing. Our client, a Global 1000 gaming, hospitality, and construction concern, relied on a small segment of VIP customers for most of its revenues, profits, and growth at its casinos. The competition to attract VIP players is fierce in the gaming industry, as a single whale can contribute millions or more to the bottom line. They had made massive investments to lure the world's most wealthy, with private elevators opening onto opulent villas, Roman bathtubs concealed under sliding marble floors, kilos upon kilos of gold leaf adorning the casino, and an outpost of L'Ambrosé, the only French restaurant to continue to uphold three Michelin stars since its founding. Upon arrival in Macau, VIPs were received by a diamond-encrusted Rolls-Royce Phantom, part of their fleet of 30 vehicles that made up the largest custom order the luxury car maker had ever received. When casinos cultivate VIPs, they provide more than these luxurious perks. They also collect data, such as time spent playing, average stake per hand, average number of hands per hour, and skill level. This information helps casinos optimize a high roller's gambling experience as well as their own profits. A VIP's financial information is also valuable, but this information extends beyond credit card details. Knowledge of offshore bank accounts and global real estate holdings increases a casino's comfort in extending credit and collecting on it. In the hands of a competitor, this data could be used to identify and steal their most profitable customers. During our meeting with the casino managers, they told us about the customer relationship management system that they've used to collect data, analyze, monetize the wealth of this proprietary data that they had on their VIPs. 
data was constantly collected from multiple locations across Macau and transmitted via the local telecommunications network to a centralized operations center. When asked about these networks, the casino managers replied that network connections were not encrypted. They had not identified the need. The next question we asked, the one that caused our wide-eyed manager to blush, was who owns the telecommunications firm? It was as if all the air was sucked out of the room. The casino operators realized at that point that the telecommunications firm, which had unlimited access to their most sensitive customer information as it traversed their network, was owned by a conglomerate that included their largest competitor. We see this all the time in our work. It's so difficult to understand what risks you face and how to prioritize your defenses without an understanding of the dynamics of the broader environment in which your business operates. What we have learned over the years is that people won't manage a risk that they don't understand or believe in. A risk is only worth our attention if the impact is relevant to us and sufficiently severe, and we are confident that the risk reduction activities will work. Otherwise, we'll never commit to managing the risk or we'll give up because we don't see the value. Given these observations, what does it take to build consensus within a company around effective cyber risk management? But before I answer that question, let's first start with a different question. What are cyber risks anyway? Given that we naturally pay attention to relatable risks, what you relate to inherently depends on where you sit, what your role is, what your responsibilities are. Cybersecurity and technology management think about cyber risks that ex exploit computer vulnerabilities, such as a ransomware attack, a network intrusion, or an email with a malicious attachment. Company leadership and management think about business risks that could harm the company and stakeholders, such as disruption to manufacturing, electric power transmission, for example. The differences between these risk perspectives goes beyond just thinking about computers versus business operations. Upon further reflection, these cyber risks are not actually risks in the same sense as business risks. Rather, they are a causality. They induce business risks. Cyber risks are effectively business risks brought on by cyber attacks. Cyber attacks cause business risks to materialize. This adjustment might seem like a minor change in the way that you think about cyber risk, but the shift in mindset is profound. It opens a new way of thinking about and describing cyber risk that creates a direct connection between business risk and computer vulnerabilities. It provides a common basis for discussion between company leadership and technical management. And it forms the basis for risk management prioritization, remediation, and it constructs a single thread that informs all cybersecurity investment and activity. Now that we know what cyber risks really are, the next question is how can we identify, evaluate, and ultimately manage them? To accomplish that, you first need to establish a common basis of information for discussions and decisions. Identifying and fixing cyber risks is a social process to accurately assess where the most important ones lie, you must consider the viewpoints and opinions of a wide range of employees. Everyone from executives, senior managers, and cybersecurity specialists to IT teams will have their own perspectives and opinions. By involving a broad group, you'll build a common understanding of the relevant facts and details early on, which will help you reach consensus when you subsequently need to manage the risks. To help companies organize and share the relevant information with a wide audience, we've developed a tool we call the Cyber Threat Narrative. It addresses four parts of the story of a cyber potential cyber attack, a key business activity and the risk to it, the systems that support that activity, the potential type of attacks and possible consequences, and the adversaries most likely to carry attacks out. Now, I would like to discuss the storyline of the Cyber Threat Narrative by walking through each of these four elements. The first element of a narrative is the identification and description of a critical business activity, the benefits it provides, and the risks it faces. They're specific to your company. If you're a hospital, it can include conducting operations. If you're a hotel, managing reservations. And for logistics firms, it's flying planes and sailing ships. 
Once a business activity is identified as critical, the next step is sizing its associated business risks. Often risks are types of disruption to these business activities, such as the inability to book hotel rooms or sail a container ship. There are also collateral risks that can harm your company, customers, or other stakeholders. In the case of a chemical manufacturing company, a release of poisonous chemicals into the environment is one example, or in the case of a hospital, removing the right kidney instead of the left in an operation. The most publicized collateral risk is the loss of confidential comfort customer information, such as passwords and credit card information. In practice, identifying critical business activities and their risk is a largely straightforward exercise, as much of the work has already been done in the form of detailed risk registers, hazard analyses, and heat maps that have already been developed and maintained across the organization. In corporate annual reports, you'll find management's perspective on the top risks to the company and the board's risk appetite. The target for a cyber attack is one or more of the computer systems that support a business activity. Therefore, to mount a cyber defense, your company next needs to identify these computer systems and the services and functionality that they provide. So we need to know what these are. Both traditional and corporate IT systems, such as servers and databases, and industrial control systems in which computers control machinery. Collecting this data is also straightforward in that IT departments have implemented automated inventorying of computers and software. However, these tools can't identify which assets are the most important. By cataloging them on the basis of a business activity, a company can target and prioritize computer vulnerability remediation and enhance protections where they're most needed. The starting point for this is talking to the people who work in the day-to-day -day operations of the activity. Ask, what applications do you use to do your job? IT can fill the details to identify both the dedicated systems supporting an activity and the shared infrastructure an activity relies on. The next element of a cyber threat narrative identifies and characterizes the different types of cyber attacks that could cause a business risk to materialize. This entails examining the approaches and requirements for a successful attack. At the most basic level, cyber attacks exploit vulnerabilities in computer systems. Malware attacks, for instance, use malicious software to take advantage of programming mistakes in applications. Your cybersecurity staff can and should identify the kinds of techniques that could target vulnerabilities in your critical computer systems. There are countless ways a cyber attack can be executed, and if it isn't practical and, and useful to enumerate them all, but at a minimum, for an attack to succeed, you need to identify how the attacker could gain access to company computing infrastructure and compromise supporting systems, thus disrupting critical business activities. In addition, you need to identify the impact and consequences resulting from a cyber attack on the business activity. Categories include lost revenue, reputational damage, and legal liability, for example. Executive leadership and senior management are well positioned to identify the fallout from disruptions to the key business activities and should guide your cybersecurity group on this task. Operations and system staff can point out additional consequences. Specialists from other departments, such as legal, finance, and compliance, can spot potential collateral damage. A simple set of what-if questions will make conversations with all these players fruitful. Finally, you need to identify your cyber adversaries. Knowing who's out to get you helps in addressing the credibility of a threat. Just because a vulnerability exists doesn't mean it will be exploited. Cyber attacks are not natural disasters. They don't just happen. You need an adversary with means, technical and logistic capability, or money to buy these. And also, they need to be motivated to attack you. What do you have that they want? Why would they want to hurt you? Your adversaries are specific to who you are and what you do. Edward Snowden leaked information because he was unhappy with the NSA's expansive violation of personal privacy in the US and around the world. Similarly, if you're a power producer with a portfolio of carbon intensive generation assets, you may be concerned about environmental activists who might want to disrupt these operations. If you have a rich balance sheet with access to lots of capital and a fleet of expensive operating assets, you may be concerned about criminals that would hold these assets for ransom. It's important to use your imagination here as adversaries may not be initially evident, 
such as in the casino case we just discussed. That's it. This is a story you need to tell with a narrative arc that always includes these four elements in this order. Critical business activities and risks, what systems support these activities, relevant cyber attacks, and a realistic understanding of your adversaries. Now we recognize that no company has the resources to do everything. There's just too much cybersecurity work to do regardless of available resources. Too many security products to deploy, too many security procedures to write, let alone read, yet you need to do something. Our advice, don't spend more, spend more wisely. Cyber threat narratives help answer the questions, what should we spend our money on and how much money should we spend? The thread that runs through all of this information helps unify the entire company in identifying, prioritizing, and managing its most critical cyber risks. Further, they inform all cybersecurity investments and activities, including cybersecurity staffing, both number and skills, investments in cybersecurity controls and processes, cyber crisis leadership presentation, and they can even inform cybersecurity organization design. For example, we put the CISO for a critical infrastructure company reporting to the chief operating officer because cyber attacks on its industrial control systems were the company's biggest cyber risks. Now, let's return to our original cyber risk question. What does it take to build consensus? This new perspective on cyber risk and the activities it drives builds required company consensus on cyber risk management. The identification and prioritization of cyber risk shifts the conversation from a technical discussion to one firmly grounded in protecting your company's most important business activities and operations. It puts technical information in context so that the ways in which your company collects, analyzes, organizes technical information relating to cyber, cyber attack techniques, convener vulnerabilities and computing infrastructure all contribute to developing the necessary knowledge protecting the business activities leadership has prioritized. Cyber threat narratives contain a unified collection of information that establishes the relationship between cyber attacks and their potential risks to critical business activities. Groups and individuals within your company will use different slices of this information according to their roles and responsibilities. The thread that runs through all this information helps unify the entire company in identifying prioritization, and managing their most critical cyber risks. The process of cyber threat narrative development provides a formal structure for contributions and collaboration across a wide range of staff, from executive leadership and cybersecurity specialists to those involved in the day-to-day -day conduct of business and those who manage the supporting computer systems. This promotes consensus around cyber risk priorities and the activities your company needs to undertake to address them. Finally, it supports engagement and oversight. Your responsibilities are clear at every stage of narrative development. So are the assurances you need from the company you oversee in terms of the cyber risk related activities it's undertaken, topics it has addressed, people it is involved, and the documentation that is delivered. Managing cyber risk is just one of several practical capabilities presented in our latest book, A Leader's Guide to Cybersecurity, Why Boards Need to Lead and How to Do It. In the book, we show how the key to effectively combating these cyber risks is right in front of us, yet not necessarily where we'd initially look. Familiar corporate practices such as maintaining focus on well-understood business risks, applying existing levers of corporate governance, and promoting a culture of open and transparent communications all have critical roles to play. What's more, boards and company leadership can accomplish this through their existing oversight and management responsibilities all without the need to become technology experts. You see, it does not require additional investment or specific expertise. It just requires that we change our perspective. And with that change, we can radically reduce the risk of cyber attacks to our companies. And you can start today.